on dresses and talent acquisition. I'm Savita from People Matters and uh, would take you through the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, we have the privilege of having uh, with us uh, Claire Fix, uh, Director Customer Solutions, UK SHL Group. Also with us is um, Michael Lee, Consultant SHL India. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, give you a small brief on the TA Leadership League. Um, the TA Leadership League is an initiative uh, which is specially designed for the TA leaders, helping them take recruitment to the totally next level. Now, this league is a combination of a bunch of activities like the newsletter, the webinar, half-day events, and awards. Um, I'll let you know a little bit more on the awards at the end of the webinar. Um, just to give you a brief on the webinar today, we have um, we would cover the diverse aspects um, of best practices adopted by companies in the talent acquisition domain globally. Uh, this webinar will definitely address the impact of poor selection decisions, ways to measure talent accurately and quickly, evaluate and quantify talent acquisition process, benchmark talent externally. A little about our uh, today's speaker, uh, we have Claire who joined SHL in 2006 and has worked in the talent ma management and psychometrics field for eight years. Product development uh, was where she started her career and today as Director of Custom Solutions, Claire leads a global team in delivering bespoke assessments and analysis to clients to help address their talent management concerns. The today's um, sponsors for the webinar for helping us uh, make this uh, program possible are um, the principal partners is uh, CEB SHL India. CEB SHL is the leader in talent measurement solutions, driving better business results for clients through superior people, intelligence, and decisions, from hiring to recruiting to employee development and succession planning. Also, we have um, our knowledge partner and our knowledge and RPO partner, People Strong, who is um, a leading HR outsourcing company specializing in HR shared services, recruitment, payroll, and compliance management, and HR technology solutions. With a pan India presence, they also provide services to global players across industries and are one of the first movers in the BFSI ITES and education recruitment process outsourcing in India. We have saved uh, a time for you to ask questions at the end of the webinar. For those who are watching live on the webinar, you can definitely submit your questions at any point in time during the presentation through the question and answer section on your webinar. We will try and respond to almost all your questions uh, as far as time allows. Um, we have a full exciting agenda for the webinar today, so um, Claire should take the lead. So without any further delay, I'll hand over the webinar to Claire. Over to you, Claire. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As Savita said, um, I mainly work in uh, assessment design and development, and I've presented at a few conferences about this topic and developed some guidance and best practice for assessment use. As Safita also said, please don't hesitate to send through any questions that you have while I'm going through the presentation today. As you can tell, um, I'm British born. I have a very English accent. If there's anything that you don't understand um, talking through or I'm speaking too quickly, which I do tend to do sometimes, then uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt um, and I'll try and slow down my pace. four main points um, that I thought would go through today and I've prepared some information for. So looking at the impact of poor selection decisions, ways that we can measure talent accurately and quickly, how to evaluate and quantify your talent acquisition process, and how you could benchmark your talent externally to understand your internal talent better. As you know, SHL now part of the CEB business, which has opened our doors to a lot of useful research and information in the areas we work in. I'm going to share some of this research with you today. So hiring managers are confident they made the right selection decisions, 
Performance is generally higher once they're hired into the role. For candidates whose hiring managers were less confident, performance in the role is slightly lower, and unfortunately, 50% of decisions are not the right ones. We can help managers to be more confident in the selection decisions they're making by supporting their decision-making processes with objective assessments. The wrong talent may mean your line managers are wasting time and money dealing with issues of staff turnover, shrinkage, absenteeism, poor performance and customer complaints. So it's critical to assess the key behaviours that are essential for good job performance in that particular role and not just identify a candidate's liking of the product or industry that you work in. Remember that you need to reject a candidate but keep a potential customer. So proactively managing the rejection process is really key to ensuring that you, con you continue to have good customer experiences. Potential, the candidates can be potential customers and dedicate a, a blog or write a one-off post on their Facebook page about their recruitment processes. It's good practice to respond to all needs in the rejection process, but remember that a slightly delayed rejection could be better than an instant machine rejection and that the communication message could be, should be personalised. There are also two ways. So thinking about the candidate and trying to encourage them to consider if you're definitely the right business and company that they would, should be working in. Review all the communications that go between the organisation and the candidate to make sure that your messages are clear and consistent. And giving a candidate thank you email and feedback, or even better, some career advice, can really help to boost the candidate experience. Our clients even offer vouchers for products as a thank you for their interest in the particular organisation and for going through the recruitment process. One point is to um, suggest that the candidates apply again in the future and perhaps even highlight some of the more suitable roles that you might have available at that time for that particular candidate. Candidate experience is key. A poor candidate experience portrays a poor employer brand, which can impact badly on the consumer brand. A good employer brand requires an objective, transparent and timely recruitment process, which also reflects the consumer brand values. Almost half of job applicants have been left with a negative view of a company following the recruitment process, and of those, 54% took some form of action against the organisation. Job applicants have been taking out their frustration on businesses where it matters most, with almost one in five of those who've had a negative recruitment experience taking their custom elsewhere as a direct result. This is even higher amongst men, with almost a quarter of men saying this. It's 25 to 34-year-old age group that's most likely to do this, showing that businesses could be at risk of losing customers for life. TV research shows that businesses must remember that candidates are customers too, and as well as putting them off the company, they can also spread negative messages quickly through word of mouth and social media. A third of candidates complain to their friends and family after experiencing a bad recruitment process, and almost one in ten took to using the web, using social media sites, and personal blogs to spread the word of their negative view. 35 to uh, 44 year olds were most likely to use social media sites and 25 to 34 year olds were the group most likely to use blogs. Proactively scan the internet and social media sites to understand perceptions of your recruitment process and your employer brand. Five of these job hunters stopped buying from a company as a result of this negative experience. So it's something that we should really be considering seriously. The possible reason for a negative candidate experience comes down to the stretch of HR resources to dedicate to the process. Candidate volumes have increased significantly. Organisations have not responded to hiring new recruiting staff resources. 
often, often swamped by job applications, leaving little time to engage with candidates properly and dedicate enough time to consider each application. The recruitment process conveys a poor employer brand, which can affect the consumer brand, which is difficult to build and even more difficult to repair once it's damaged. This could deter potential customers from buying from you and from future talent applying for roles in your business. Applying for roles has never been easier as recruiters are being flooded with online applications. The competition for jobs has led to a scattergun approach to job hunting, with many recruiters being inundated with unsuitable applications and relying on manual, time-consuming and expensive sifting processes. Figures from recruitment professionals show a quarter are overstretched and that this is frequently leading to a drop in standards. Many have admitted they are now unable to let candidates know when they've received their application, provide detailed feedback to an interviewed candidate, or let the candidate know they haven't been successful after the initial application. Another possible reason for a negative candidate experience might be the information that's available and shared with candidates in the job advert, on the company website, or during the recruitment process. A lot of time and money can be wasted on hiring the wrong staff. Often an organisation will inaccurately portray a job role or the organisation without realising which leads to a high turnover of staff reduced motivation and underperformance. Hiring the wrong talent may mean that your line managers are wasting time and money dealing with issues of employees leaving, absenteeism, poor performance or customer complaints. So it's critical to assess for and recruit against the key behaviours that are essential for good job performance and not just identify candidates liking for a particular industry. Lack of a clear employment brand doesn't let candidates gauge their fit with the organisation and therefore impacts the quality of applicants. This poor person organisation fit results in lower employee performance and increased turnover of staff, so it's important to ensure that information about the organisation and the job role is accurate and realistic. in particular is undergoing a transformation in the way it interacts with customers as the purchasing experience becomes a critical differentiator. It's therefore essential for retailers to ensure that employees they attract and retain act as brand ambassadors and they have the ability and potential to drive customer loyalty in a highly competitive market and strive to deliver a memorable customer experience they need to identify the employee's beha the employee behaviours that will create the desired customer experience. Let's talk through three companies and what we've learned about what they're doing with their brand and attraction. Now, this isn't necessarily something w that we've supported them to do from SHL, but I think it's always important to understand what companies are doing and how then our solutions and services can feed in to support them. So in discussions with M&S, we found out that they have differences in the number of candidates who are attracted to each of the M&S 400 stores, and this prompted the company to rethink its one-size-fits-all one attraction strategy in favour of a more segmented approach. So Marks & Spencer's applied different metrics to understand the severity of the attraction challenge at the store level and then categorize stores into segments according to the severity of that attraction challenge. And then they applied the customer brand promotion strategies for each of the particular segments. So the key learning point here was that M&S could prioritize investments to areas of greatest need to maximize their return on investment for candidate attraction. Results speak for themselves with a reduced spend on attraction, but an increased performance in store. For Starbucks, they realised that they were failing to deliver the employment value proposition to current employees. That is, the balance of rewards and benefits at work, 
and that had a negative impact on employees' level of commitment and ultimately their employees' willingness to promote the organisation as a best employer. Starbucks delivers its um, employment value proposition to current employees now by defining behavioural expectations of the working environment and establishing interactive occasions for reinforcement and feedback to their employees. So they'd be able to identify and respond to any misalignments within their workforce. As a result, over 80% of employees would recommend Starbucks to, to friends who are seeking work. They, decide, they realized that they had an inconsistent employment brand proposition and recruiting processes across the different multiple business units that Philips has, which led to negative candidate experiences and failure to meet their recruiting goals. So in response, Philips identified the points in the candidate attraction and recruiting cycle that most critically impact on candidate perceptions. And in identifying these major touch points, Philips was able to align these better to expectations which resulted in nearly a 37% increase in referrals and 60% new hire satisfaction with the recruitment process. So thinking about employer brand then, what's the actual message in your organization and what is it saying about itself? Do you have a sense of the organization's values and culture? And is your website geared towards customers and potential employees? What would a potential applicant think about your website and do you think they'd be encouraged to apply from the information that they read on there? Do these messages reflect what you see yourself in the organisation or are they misleading? The brand has a lot to, to define. It defines what's in it for me, so what the candidates and potential employers get for working for the particular company. Defines your business as a place to work, it articulates your reputation as a place to work, and it defines what your business really believes in. It also defines your desired connection with employees and how you're going to communicate and treat them. To your prospective employees, honest and realistic enough to encourage unsuitable candidates to deselect themselves from the process. If you offer a candidate a job and they decline it, do you find out why they're not interested? And do you make sure that people who are interviewing candidates create the image that we want to convey from a business? So all, I think, interesting questions to think about your particular businesses. There are some shortfalls in some of the typical recruitment practices that businesses adopt. So, for example, we often rely on candidates' work history, um, for example, how long they've worked in a particular role or industry for, but do we know that length of service or years of experience is really a good predictor of job success? With assessments, we often use knowledge-based or skills assessments used to look at job fit or potential. But behaviour has a strong and important part to play in predicting job success and is often forgotten. With interviews, how well are your interviews structured and conducted? Are they linked properly to the key predictors of good job performance? Do the questions lead candidates to come up with the right answer? Are candidates probed enough to expand on their answers and explain their individual contributions in examples that they talk about? Is the interview content and format standardised and fair to all candidates? The advancement of technology, yes, technology can be expensive to implement, but it can save a lot of time for recruiters by administering online assessments and automatically being able to track candidate progress through a particular recruitment process. on investment is really important for any businesses investing heavily in recruitment and HR and finance directors will often ask you what or, and ask, often ask you and want to understand 
if the investment in a recruitment process is supporting the business in the right way. So simple validation studies can support the measurement of this by comparing the job performance of those who score well in the recruitment process and those who score slightly lower. Benchmarking. So some companies are better at using the data that they have than others, and some companies are good at benchmarking internally to understand where their strengths and weaknesses lie for a particular group of employees. But not many companies take this further and actually compare their talent externally to their competitors. And this is something that we'll come back to later. And finally, references seem to still be relied on a lot, but they've become more and more standardized with the fear of legal actions for declaring someone as a good employee who later underperforms in their new role. Generally, they tend to tell us what, pro what position somebody has held and how long they've held it for, but they rarely tell us anything about the behavior of the individual at work and whether they're likely to be successful at the next role that they undertake. This is SHL's recruitment framework for success, and I'll talk you through these areas briefly now, and we can zoom in on some of these over the next few slides. So looking at define, which is the first stage of our process, this is looking at the requirements of the role and trying to understand what success looks like for that particular role. So thinking about what abilities, skills and behaviours will be required now and in the future for success. So how can we quickly and accurately measure the potential that someone has and whether they're likely to perform well in the role they're, con they're being considered for, and we can use psychometric assessments to unlock and understand this potential. Benchmarking. So we can compare your talent externally to competitors in your particular industry. So how does your talent compare? Where should you focus your recruitment campaigns? And what areas are you lacking or have a competitive advantage in? Then we can look at improvement, so we can act on insights and recommendations from the data and improve your recruitment process. And finally, we can need to evaluate. This stage is often forgotten, but I think is really key to understanding how successful your new talent acquisition processes are. So looking at the return of investment on your process, are you able to hire top talent with your improved process? And are you investing your money wisely? Sorry, I'm just trying to flip through to the next slide, um, but it doesn't seem to be working. Bear with me one minute. So in each of the five stages, we have a high-touch and a low-touch solution to support hiring needs. So for example, we can support you to define your job roles by using our universal competency framework or design a more bespoke framework to reflect your individual organization's culture and values. We can support you with online assessments, which would be a low-touch solution, or we can support you with one-to-one -one consultant led assessments, which should be more of a high touch solution. And whichever option you might go for, whether with FHL or another competitor, really depends on your needs and what will suit the particular applicants. So for example, it might sound obvious, but if you're recruiting for volume roles, then a high touch, uh, sorry, a low touch solution of using online um, psychometric assessments it's probably the best route to go down. It's quick and easy and cost effective. But if you're recruiting for CEOs or other um, leadership roles, then perhaps a more one-to-one -one, uh, high-touch solution would be better in order to engage the uh, particular candidates that you're recruiting. We also have a range of external benchmarking reports available to support the types of questions that you have as a business 
and whether you want to explore your data at a high level or a more in-depth level. So focusing on measurement now then, we'll take a look at how we can measure talent accurately and quickly to predict those who are most likely to perform well in the job role. Ensuring that a process is engaging and providing candidates with insight and feedback can lead to an overall positive experience as already discussed in the introduction. Example of some of the SHL assessments, um, we have the Verify suite of ability assessments that use an item banked approach to increase test security for online administration. So each candidate takes a unique test. So that if candidates were sharing knowledge about the assessments with each other, then that has very little impact on their ability test scores. The initial assessment is taken online, unsupervised at home, screen out those who do not meet the threshold for certain abilities that are important for good performance in the role. Those who have progressed to later assessment stages are also invited to take a second supervised assessment to verify their original scores and remove anyone from the process who may have cheated by asking someone to take the initial assessment for them. We have these particular assessments for verbal, numerical, inductive, mechanical and checking uh, reasoning ability tests to measure for these particular um, abilities. They use for volume recruitment and for example a lot of our banking clients tend to use a numerical reasoning ability test for obvious reasons. We have a personality assessment called OPQ and it's used to understand candidates' working preferences and therefore a fit to a particular role. So, for example, in sales roles, good performers tend to like persuading other people, they like to be sociable, and they like to network with others. Researchers, on the other hand, prefer to work with detailed data and like to work independently for long periods of time. And these differences in preferred behaviours are good predictors of job success, retention, and promotions internally. DSI is another um, personality assessment we have. It was originally designed for lower level roles where adherence to safety rules and instructions are vital for job success. And this is a rather crude and quick measure of performance, which when used alongside other stages of a process, is a good predictor of performance in these types of roles. So things like mining, railway maintenance, and manual labor. The issues are really paramount. And finally, we have um, what we call talent simulations. So these can be off the shelf for particular roles or custom built for roles that we don't have a standard offering for currently. So they engage candidates in questions which submerge the candidates in scenarios or situations they would come across on the job. If they give candidates a good realistic preview of the particular role and they're also the most fun type of assessment to take as they use media formats. So we can develop these assessments in either 2D, 3D or video media um, solutions which is much more engaging and interesting for candidates to take. And we've got some research to show that they really do improve that candidate experience. I've got three success stories um, from some of our clients that I just thought I'd walk you through. Um, for Krispy Kreme, their key challenge was to identify new employees who would work well in their changing environment, but continue to maintain their high customer service standard. So we introduced a series of psychometric assessments, including a, uh, sorry, a customer service questionnaire, where both behavioral preferences, uh, sorry, where two behavioral preferences were measured. So really key to this role were a liking for change and variety, and wanting to help other people. So we developed a custom report off the back end of this assessment for hiring managers to use 
that explained the assessment scores in Krispy Kreme's own language to reflect their culture and tone of voice. For the project, the HR director was really pleased with the outcome as it suited their corporate work culture and was fair to all of their candidates. For Swarovski, um, their concern was, a high, was the quality of hires and employee turnover in their particular stores. So we worked with their store managers to understand what competencies and skills are really important for success in the role and we developed a bespoke talent simulation so candidates would be able to experience the store and understand the role during the application process. And this was also uh, one of our 3D multimedia offerings, so it really was highly engaging for the candidates. The outcome was that time and cost to hire was reduced, uh, staff turnover was reduced, and their sales were increased. So all round, um, quite a good story. Finally, for Marks and Spencers, um, they wanted a more efficient recruitment process to improve the quality of hire. And we developed two bespoke assessments for them, a realistic job preview and a situational judgment test. So the realistic job preview provided an insight into the role so potential applicants could decide if they would fit the role and organization, and therefore whether they wanted to apply for the role. So the situational judgment test also provided this insight and candidates were then scored um, on how they responded to the particular situations and scenarios that they were asked to think about. It was a more effective process as well as a more robust process, with 76% of those scoring well in assessments being rated as exceeding or outstanding in their first six months performance appraisal. Let's focus on evaluate. So we'll take a look at how you can evaluate and quantify your talent acquisition processes. And business outcome studies are the way that SHL do this in partnership with our clients. And I can share some of the examples with you now. As I'm sure you know, it's the big data era. I'm sure you've heard a lot about uh, big data in the press and in um, particular HR uh, magazines recently, um, and everyone started to think about what this means for their particular businesses. So people intelligence provides information about individuals within an organization that can help businesses, sorry, that can help businesses and their leaders um, in making informed strategic talent decisions that result in business outcomes associated with good performance on a large scale provides the insight that companies need in order to turn arguments of change and development into business cases or discussions that have quantifiable actions and measurable outcomes. By this, I mean that we can use data on people and organizations can start to make far wide-reaching impact on the performance of their business. Of the best-in-class companies, identified by the Aberdeen Group, 63% of these who put success down to greater access to relevant data. And in addition to this, the use of pre and post hire assessments is also a key differentiator between best in class companies and others. Particularly like the phrase, in God we trust and everyone else has to bring data because it's quite funny, but unfortunately quite true. So, uh, brief examples to walk you through. Um, this is the first one. So, we worked with an electronics retailer um, and their sales associates. And we found that those salespeople who achieved high assessment scores averaged 19% more in monthly sales which was then equivalent to an extra $12,000 per employee. They were also 37% more likely to meet their sales goals, which when we applied this across the entire organization, translated to over $70 million in increased sales per year 
if the assessments had been used in the right way and that they had just recruited people who were, perform who were high performers on the particular assessment solution that we implemented for them. Second finding with a telecommunications provider. So these were customer service agents and those who achieved a high assessment score were also found to handle calls 9% faster, were 74% more likely to meet customer service rating goals, and 46% more likely to be rated as top performers overall by their managers. Across the entire workforce, this increased productivity associated with the lower average handle uh, call time translated into a cost reduction of over $22 million annually. And the third example is from an Italian car manufacturer and team leaders who we assessed using the OPQ there. So we found that those team leaders who scored well on technical orientation and quality orientation as measured through our assessments were four times as likely to lead teams with low error rates. And those team leaders who scored highly on technical orientation were twice as likely to make innovation and change proposals to the board, which was a really important factor of good performance for this particular client. So three quite strong case studies there of how we can evaluate the effectiveness of talent acquisition solutions and really provide good business cases for clients to continue um, using those particular solutions. And focusing on benchmarking, we can take a look at how you can benchmark your talent externally, um, which is something that I talked about uh, briefly just earlier. HL, we have a huge database of assessment information uh, for candidates and employees who've taken our um, particular assessments. So we've got over 100 million um, people who have taken our assessments, and that increases by approximately 25 million every year. So we're always adding to our data set. 30 countries, 37 industry sectors. 31 business functions and five job levels. So we've got information on graduates, managers and, and professionals and entry level um, job roles as well. The um, traditional questions we asked um, or we can answer when thinking about data and talent management. But thinking about talent acquisition in particular, we can think about where the strongest talent is coming from. For example, if it's through recruiters, recommendations, or particular advertisements, and what area your talent is lacking in, and therefore what competencies you might want to focus in the future for particular recruitment. We can also look at how effective each stage of the selection process is in identifying top talent. So these are the types of questions we've been supporting our clients with recently. And Talent Analytics, which is our external benchmarking proposition, has been available for the past 18 months. So it's still a fairly new idea um, and a new uh, delivery that we're supporting our clients with. But it has been taken up very strongly. Um, we have a lot of interest. And we are starting to help a lot of our clients to answer some of these exact questions and other talent management issues by using external benchmarking. In summary, um, solutions can give you an insight into how you can objectively select the very best people, um, how you can reduce time and cost to selection decisions, and how you can decrease turnover and increase motivation and people actually wanting to work in your business. Unlike other solutions, we tend to use our framework um, proven for success. We use cutting edge technology, so I talked about the multimedia options that we have, and we can employ external benchmarks to provide insight on how your volume hires compare to your competitors.
So with that we have available from our assessments, we've done a lot of research to identify trends across different industries, gender and geography. And we actually have our own leadership model, which is made up from a combination of behavioural competencies and abilities that we've identified as important for success in leadership roles. So using the leadership, we've identified which countries have strong potential for leadership for today. That is, countries where there are strengths in those areas identified for good leadership. So being able to effectively manage individuals and operations, being able to build effective relationships, being able to evaluate information and problems to identify solutions, and being able to adapt well to change. You can see from the list on the left-hand side of this um, slide, Hong Kong, Germany, and the UK are the top three countries for leaders today. Morrow have been identified as having strengths in some of those areas, identified for good leadership, but needing to develop other areas. Countries, India is sixth on the list, so a serious contender for making strong leaders in the future. Do you know how your leaders compare to these competency areas? How to tap into and to develop these hidden talents within your business? against competencies important for good leadership. And in order for India to stay competitive, using people intelligence is critical to identify leaders now, since the odds of being able to do so successfully are 1 in 20, according to research. Down into more detail, we see that in Asia, leaders for today are most likely to be found in insurance, finance, professional services, or public sector. And leaders for tomorrow are usually found in banking, healthcare, and technology. So if you work in any of these industries, do you understand which people in your business are likely to be strong leaders in the future? Research has identified just one in five managers or executives have the potential to become a top leader. Do you know which individuals these are? So some food for thought and hopefully some interesting research and insights um, for you. Taking you through quite a lot of information and I'm sure there's lots that you might want to go away and think about. Um, but I've got to the end of the slide deck and if you have any questions then I'm more than happy to um, try to answer those for you now. Um, yes, uh, we do have a few questions online. Uh, to start with, uh, we have um, Abhishek who has asked you, what is the ideal number of positions a recruiter should be working on at a given point in time? Um, I think that's really going to depend on the size of your business and how many people you have in your HR team to support you. And it's all. I think it's also going to depend on what support you get internally. Um, I think each business is structured slightly differently and has um, more or less support from the, the hiring managers um, that you have within your own business. So I think it's a very difficult um, question for me to answer at the moment. I don't think there's a right or wrong number, but I think it depends across different companies and what kind of feels right for you and how you're being able to manage your time um, around the, the different number of um, openings that you're recruiting for. I don't um, know if anyone has anything right. to add to that. Yes, uh, that would be Abhishek's answer. Now we have another question from Madhu Mohan, who asks that she is from a chemical manufacturing company. Do you have tools to assess the culture fit of the candidate? Sorry, I didn't quite hear the end of the question. Do we have tools to measure? The, the culture fit of the candidate. Okay, um, yes we do. Um, so we have a number of different tools that can measure behaviours. And it's really behaviours that you're drilling down um, into when you're thinking about culture fit. So you're thinking about um, how individuals behave 
and uh, conform to the culture of the organisation. Um, so yes, we definitely do, and we've supported quite a few of our clients with measuring culture fit and fit to organisational values. Um, I think that would have answered uh, Madhu's question. We have another question from Vijaya Gauri. Um, how can we identify if a person is really interested in joining or staying with the organization or is looking at it as a stopgap until he or she gets a desired job? Mm. I think that's something that's actually quite difficult to measure. Um, we can look at motivation. So you can look at um, if the particular candidate is really motivated by career progression um, and if they are, then you might want to ask them um, up front, really, whether they are interested to progress their career with you as a business or whether they want to kind of progress their career in other ways externally. Now, I know that candidates might not always answer those questions um, honestly, but it's something that, that kind of motivation um, could be used to kind of tra try to tap into and try to understand what's really motivating the candidates. Um, and then try to kind of unpick those a bit more um, in your interviews. Also, she continues a question by asking you, how do we know if a candidate is genuine and gives correct information during a face-to-face -face interview? <laughs> um, <laughs> again, I think it's very, very difficult to do. Um, I think if you're trained in body language at all, um, then it can help. So um, if a candidate is fiddling with things, if they're um, going red, if they're stuttering, um, it, it can be an indicator um, that they might not be telling you the truth, but it also can be an indicator of just general anxiety um, and being nervous um, in the interview. So. I think it's a very, very difficult thing to to answer. Um, I think it's something that probably comes with experience. All right. We have another question in from Alka Singh. Um, is there any assessment tool available to assess the sales skill of a candidate? Which one is more real, reliable? I'm sorry. Yes, we do. So. Um, Within SHL, we have, as I mentioned, the OPQ, which is our Occupational Personality Questionnaire. And off the back of that, there's a particular sales uh, competency report. So the OPQ is actually a really versatile behaviour tool because it taps into a number of key personality traits. And they're important for a wide variety of different roles but then we can look and drill into um, those particular competencies that are important for success in a sales role, and that's what that um, sales report does off the back end of the OPQ. Hi. Um, if I can add a little, hi, my name is Michael, and I'm from uh, the SGL India team. Um, to add on to what uh, Claire said, apart from the sales report, which is an output of the OPQ, um, you know, another option uh, that uh, you know clients could look at is a frontline sales uh, hiring uh, tool called the Customer Contact Styles Questionnaire or the CCSQ. Uh, this is typically used in cases where uh, you know the incumbents need to deal with customers, you know, on a um, in a, in a face-to-face -face interaction regularly, and uh, it is based on the OPQ, though is much shorter and is targeted towards capturing the sales skills which are required by frontline sales executives. So apart from the OPQ, there's also another option of the CCSQ, which is available. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Um, we have a question from uh, Smriti Korean, and um, her question is, as we usually do recruit in large numbers, how do we ensure quality of hire is not forgotten in the game of making a huge number of offers? Sorry, can you just repeat the question? Yes. Usually do recruit in large numbers. How do we ensure quality of hire is not forgotten in the game of making a huge number of offers? 
The other thing that comes down to um, the evaluate part that I was talking about earlier. Um, so when we put um, selection solutions together, we usually try to validate these solutions and make sure that they really are um, benefiting the client and they really are predicting um, good, uh, good success in their particular role and are tapping into um, the behaviours that are important and being able to identify those who are really going to be quality hires. Um, with each of the assessment solutions, we work with our clients to understand where the cutoff needs to be to be able to cut out enough people in the recruitment process that um, aren't displaying those particular behaviours or competencies, be able to move those forward um, who are displaying uh, those right uh, competencies for the job role something that come, that we try to do at the evaluate stage, but that evaluate stage could be used earlier on in the process just to make doubly sure that what we are doing and putting in place is definitely going to work for us, the client. Um, we, uh, we adding something in there? No, I think that, you know, largely covers it. In fact, this is, uh, you know, one of the first points which Claire has raised is uh, presentation itself, which is, you know, not enough uh, time or other overstretched recruiters, um, you know, sort of working in the Indian context for over a decade now, that uh, recruiters very often, you know, have to walk that thin line between delivering quantity um, as well as quality of hires. But I think what, you know, what can really work building over their set is to ensure that support system within the recruitment team itself to ensure that there is, a, you know, a, a, an equal amount of importance given to both. Brilliant. Um, thank you. I think uh, I think it's 3:55, and uh, we'll have to wrap the session at this point in time with the question and answer session for the webinar today. Uh, but before we end this session, I would like to inform you that uh, we have uh, the TA Leadership League Awards open for applications. And uh, we have started receiving uh, applications from across various organizations already. Um, we do have the applications open until 23rd of this month, and you can definitely apply us uh, using the uh, web link that you can see on the on your screen at the moment. Uh, for more details uh, around our events, uh, you can definitely log on to peoplematters.in at events. And uh, once again, we thank um, today's webinar uh, principal partner CEB SHL India and knowledge and RPO partner People Strong. Finally, a special thanks to Claire, the speaker for the webinar, for her time and invaluable information uh, that she has been sharing for today. Also, Michael, thank you for your inputs um, during the question and answer session. And I'd like to thank everybody, um, every audience uh, of the webinar who have been participating for today's presentation. We will come back to you with many more such webinars. Uh, I think uh, we can conclude the webinar for today. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Pleasure is ours. Good day. Thank you. Thank you.